So uh, I'm supposed to talk about cloud native interact with scalability here. And as you can hear, my voice is not a perfect one. I got a call a few days ago. So uh, forgive me for uh, the strange noises that <clears throat> I might make during the presentation. Uh, I created a boring slide. I say it's boring because it's included in every presentation that I usually see. And it includes my name, my email address, which can be looked up from anywhere. Whoa, it's actually going away. OK, so the, here is the boring slide. However, one important thing that it details is that I'm working for this company called Baseflow. And this company works in implementing FinRact for our enterprise clients, as was presented in <coughs> this morning's presentation in the FinTech track. Now, I also work for the companies that are listed down there on this slide. These are slightly related <coughs> to Baseflow. Um, and together, we can, I think, achieve pretty great things in both the fintech industry and in other industri industries as well. So after this boring slide, I also included an agenda uh, <coughs> in this one. Uh, which might summarize what I will be talking about. So last year, Istvan, one of my colleagues, was here and presented our plans and our ongoing implementations about FinRAT scalability improvement. Uh, he talked about the EKF scale cube and talked about our plans on how we <clears throat> are going to implement the instance modes or uh, how they called for uh, FinRAT. Um, and Today, I'm going to talk about how we implemented it in practice. So our enterprise clients actually requires us to run FinRact in production. And last year, I would say that FinRact's production running capabilities were OK-ish, but they were not as well defined as we would like them to be defined. And they were not as well managed as we would like them to be well managed. I will show you uh, a few of our improvements, like the improved ham chart <coughs> that, that we created uh, for FinRact. And also, I will uh, tell a few things about our managed platform concept and how it was implement, uh, how we intended to implement it last year and how this implementation changed to this year because of our clients' requirements. I will also include some of our plans for the future. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> about the EKF scale cube and FinRact. Uh, what does scalability mean? Scalability actually means a lot of things for a lot of software and <clears throat> a lot of modules and whatever. However, usually all of the scaling attempts can be characterized as, as one, of the, one of three different attempts. One is horizontal duplication. Horizontal duplication basically means that you create the data in multiple instances, or you run the software in multiple instances, thus increasing the throughput for the clients that wants to connect to the system. In addition to this, on the y-axis in this scale cube, we can see the split by function <coughs> type of scaling. It basically means that uh, whenever a software does more than one thing, which is not software, you can probably get a few of the functionalities and put them to a module and get other functionalities and put them to other modules. Now, if you have these modules, these can probably run independently without interfering each other. And this way, you can increase the scalability of the system uh, in a way where you have less dependency and less interference <coughs> among the components that are uh, running. Now, the third axis, the z-axis for this is indiscriminate split. Um, basically, it's, it's the tenant concept for FinRact. So if you want to run the system, the entire system, in multiple instances, then you can do that. Uh, in 2022, FinRact had some of these capabilities. So for example, on the x-axis, FinRact already supported database replication mechanisms, obviously independently from FinRact, actually. And it had some capabilities in connecting to multiple different database instances, fetching the data from the different database instances, thus increasing the throughput of the system. It also had support for tenants. Actually, almost from the beginning, it had the capability. However, uh, for some of our enterprise clients, these use cases were not enough. Uh, FinRAC did not scale them 
well enough for their purposes. So uh, <clears throat> during the last year and this year, we implemented some additional uh, scaling capabilities inside Feneract. Uh, on the x-axis, we actually um, created those things that uh, we call deployments and stateful sets in Feneract, uh, in, sorry, Kubernetes. So whenever you want to run the software in multiple instances, there are some unique challenges that need to be faced, like how do you scale the system? When do you know that a new instance need to be started uh, based on the client's demand? And what other parameters you need to consider, for example, to decide if you want to run deployment, which is a simple Kubernetes construct that <clears throat> just starts up a few instances, or a stateful set, which actually stores state and have some other capabilities as side effects, which will be required, as I will mention later. Uh, we also implemented batch work distribution inside Finract. <clears throat> so basically, now we have a controller that can take batch job requests. It can refine those batch job requests to workable uh, instances, workable instances or workable units of work. And we have batch workers inside Finract which can execute uh, such a piece. Uh, it enables us to scale the, for example, the close of business jobs pretty well, enabling us uh, <clears throat> to uh, scale to a higher number of accounts in the system, for example. Now, there will be talks about how exactly this Spring Batch-based implementation works later, so I will not go any deeper than that uh, on this. On the y-axis, um, we actually had one very specific improvement, splitting the functionalities is the y-axis, and this very specific improvement is the liquid-based only profile for Finract. Now, some of our clients uh, have a dedicated database administration team, and they pretty much want to keep their jobs. So they say that, hey, any kind uh, of activity that is done in the database must be done by the database administrator's team. Now, Finaract didn't really support this kind of operation. Finaract actually had the capability of upgrading the database via liquid base runs uh, whenever the software started. I think it could be disabled. However, you could not really easily define an environment where the database upgrades are run by dedicated people and uh, are run only once. So these are some of the improvements that we implemented last year. And in the next few slides, I will talk a little bit about them. So let's go to Finerect instance mode. In 2020, uh, this slide was presented uh, in ApacheCon. This slide actually described that we intend to implement Finnect instance modes, and we will have read-only API servicing, read-write API servicing, parallel batch execution servicing, <coughs> and probably dedicated uh, Finnect instance ports for front-end serving, if there is a front-end involved at all. Now, we also have shown that uh, these instances should work seamlessly with the database setups that currently exist or, or that can exist for a Finract, where we have read-write and read-only replicas of the database. And these instances should communicate with each other via a well-defined messaging system, which could either be Apache Kafka or ActiveMQ. Now, uh, in the next slide, I will show you how this plan changed during the course of the year. <clears throat> it's a very similar diagram. Actually, it was based uh, on the previous diagram, but it includes all the actual rules that has been implemented during the last year. Now, the read-only and read-write servicing APIs remained un basically unchanged from our plans. However, the batch management API servicing needed to be split to two parts, which we called batch manager, which is a single Finract instance pod, which does the work distribution that I mentioned before. And we also had to include batch workers, which are Finract pods that can actually work on actually executing the chunks of work that the batch manager prepares for them. In addition to this, at the bottom <coughs> of this diagram, I also show that 
liquid-based only profile was implemented for Finrac, which basically is a Finrac instance that starts up, runs the liquid-based scripts, and after that it immediately stops. Now, it is useful to just do the database upgrades, and maybe the DBA team can be allowed to run just that, or in our exact implementation, as you will see, we utilize it to lessen the contention for locks for the database upgrades in larger setups. Now, in addition to this, uh, we somehow needed uh, for the clients to reach the right instance in each case when we want to connect to Finract. There are multiple possibilities for this, and we actually have implemented both of the, uh, at least two of, them, uh, two, two of these capabilities. Uh, one capability is that each of these Finract servicing pools should have their own endpoints, and those endpoints should be able to be distinguished by the client. For example, they can contact, uh, uh, connect to Finerac read write endpoint and Finerac read only endpoint. However, in this case, the decision which endpoint to use falls on the client side. For at least one of our clients, it was pretty important because they wanted their clients to decide <coughs> on where they want to connect to. Now, the other possibility that we have implemented is to have an ingress solution in Kubernetes. And in Kubernetes, uh, maybe that ingress can direct the specific requests based on their characteristics to the right instance pools. And yes, it can be done. And no, it cannot be done with Kubernetes native capabilities. I will <coughs> a little bit later mention uh, why that is the case. However, if you can see this, maybe the letters are too small, but HTTP verbs get and head should go to the read instances because they always just read data from Finract and do not write data to Finract. Some specific URLs or URIs should be directed to the batch management servicing uh, Finract pod. Who is really interested? I listed all four of those URIs that need to be directed uh, to the batch management API. And by default, the API clients should go to the read-write uh, servicing APIs. Now, it is a pretty safe assumption that this works in production. And for another client of ours who didn't really want to meddle with the difficulties of their clients deciding where to send the specific requests, we implemented this ingress structure. Now, there is a caveat in this, but let's go to that later. In the bottom part of this, uh, I also listed a different ingress. The different ingress is specifically for front-ends, not, uh, not applications that are connecting to Finract, but the Finract front-end, the Mifos UI, or <coughs> however uh, one wants to call, uh, and how these connect to different types of uh, Finract-related constructs on Kubernetes. Now, uh, you might notice in this case that there is a dedicated front-end application pool, which is very similar to the read-write API servicing pool, but these are separate pools. The reason for the split is that the front-end sometimes can make the Finrack backend to freeze. Obviously, it's a software bug. However, I am not actually working on the software. I'm working on how to make the software run as stable as it can be in production. And it is pretty important for us to make these decisions to have different resources allocated for the front end and for the API clients, just so that uh, Finract as a whole can continue working even if something bad happens behind the scenes. I also listed the liquid base only profile here with the gray color. Uh, and this is because in the new Helm chart that we implemented for Finerac, we actually uh, did these improvements. All of the improvements that can be seen here, all of the things that are mentioned are supported uh, via this Helm chart. So uh, basically, now, uh, the most recommended way to run Finract on Kubernetes via this Helm chart is to 
have a pre-upgrade hook or a pre-install hook inside the ham chart that runs the liquid base profile. It basically upgrades the database and after that it stops the FinRect instance. After that, the actual installation or the actual upgrade of the ports can begin. And according to the rules, uh, the ports that are doing the actual servicing gets replaced. Now, it happens differently for deployments and stateful sets. Uh, for deployments, some new ports are started with the new version of FineRect, and after that, uh, the old ports gets deleted from the Kubernetes cluster. For stateful sets, it's a little bit different. First, the pod is shut down, and after that, the same pod with the new version of FineRect is started. Now, it's pretty important, and I don't think I've mentioned it before, that there must only be one batch manager instance running of FineRact at any time. So having it put to a deployment with the default rolling upgrade configuration just wouldn't work because in some cases it would start two of the batch managers, which could lead to different kinds of confusions. Best to avoid that. And as the operations part of <coughs> this entire organization, we need to make sure that it never happens. So we decided to run the batch manager as a stateful set. Not that it stores any kind of state, but just to enforce that only one of the instances are running. Now, this ham chart also includes some additional capabilities that help uh, FineRact running in production. These include some performance improvements. I will show some of them, some security improvements, and some availability features that were not <coughs> present in the previous version of HamChart that's included with FineRact. Obviously, it also includes the unified ingress solution that makes the decision where to route the incoming requests. However, it can also instantiate the individual ingresses and services for all the ports that are running. And I also included the disclaimer uh, on this slide that this implementation that we currently have uh, can only run on AWS, on AWS EKS, and it requires the AWS load balancer controller for the work. The reason behind this is basically that uh, the production ready features are actually cloud dependent. So for example, when you want to make sure that the FINRAC ports are distributed among the availability zones of the different cloud providers, there is no single mechanism that you can decide cloud independently which region or which availability zone you are running the software. Similarly to this, the Kubernetes ingress definition doesn't have a capability to act on HTTP verbs. So you cannot just route the GET requests to the read-only ports um, utilizing the ingress capabilities of Kubernetes. I actually looked it up and, and Kubernetes is developing and whenever they will replace uh, the ingress concept with the route concept, they will consider to include this capability. However, until then, we need a specific implementation for this and for the AWS load balancer controller, there is a specific implementation possibility for this. HAM chart screenshot. So this is how our HAM charts configuration, the values YAML file actually looks like. And I included some highlights from this. The first two highlights that we use is the performance tuning related highlights. So for example, uh, whenever you start up a FINRACT pod, based on the requests that that FINRACT pod has, it is determined how many CPUs are included in that pod, and the GVM acts on that number. So for example, if I define that the pod should start up with 100 milli CPUs, then it will be decided that there is only one CPU in the system. And if there is only one CPU in the system, the GVM will choose some internal constructs, like the number of threads working with different kinds of things inside the GVM, uh, to act like if there were only one thread uh, running capability inside there. Now, it can pretty easily be improved, and FINRAC's uh, throughput actually improves quite a lot if you specify that there are more processors in the system because, how, because of how Kubernetes scheduler internally works. I don't go to the details, just look up some other presentations by guys much more clever than me, <clears throat> on this capability, but there is a measurable difference 
in starting a funeral act like this. So that's one nice performance to mean capability. Now, the other one that I included here is that for this specific variety instance pool, I selected the G1GC for the GVM. Now, the G1GC is pretty good in the general case, and it helps Finaract to provide consistent latencies uh, in interactive requests. However, one of our findings was that actually, if you uh, are doing batch processing where latency doesn't matter that much, but throughput matters more, you might be better if you replace G1GC with parallel GC, which is an older GC implementation, providing different capabilities and different characteristics. And for example, for the batch worker pods, they provide higher throughput. Besides these performance tuning capabilities, <coughs> we also uh, added some availability features, as I mentioned, like forcing the different Kubernetes pods to run in different availability zones. And these are all supported by the Helm charts. For example, this max skew uh, parameter specifies that no matter how many Finrock pods you are running, uh, and no matter how many availability zones you put those pods on, there should never be a difference of more than one between the number of pods in the different availability zones. Uh, now, this is a pretty useful feature, basically making sure that even if one availability zone goes down, the uh, servicing will continue. The other availability feature that I sh have shown here is actually a GVM policy, uh, which changes the behavior how the DNS lookups works from inside the GVM. Uh, why it is required, you might ask. Because the GVM, mm, <clears throat> by default, works like this. Whenever it encounters a DNS name, it resolves it and caches the result of the name resolution indefinitely. So what happens whenever, for example, we connect to a database by name, and after that, the database goes to another instance because it can happen in a cloud environment. With AWS Aurora, there is planned and unplanned failover capabilities, and in these cases, uh, the name should be resolved again before connecting to the database, just so that we can get the new IP address for the database. Now, this specific tuning actually increases our availability because it forces the GVM not to cache the DNS records indefinitely, and it makes sure that whenever something bad happens inside the database or the DBA guys fail over to another site, um, Finera can continue servicing, and the DNS resolution will happen, at least periodically. So there could be only a few seconds of outage based on this. Now, the entire ham chart implementation is almost 500 lines, uh, all the, including all the configurations for the read, write, batch management, batch worker, front end, and whatever pools, including the liquid-based ones. And, uh, this is not a short time chart. However, uh, to be flexible and to support the various demands for our clients, uh, we needed to implement this. And I would say that they are pretty satisfied with what they got. Uh, there were actually not a practical outage which was caused by out, uh, outside causes. However, there were some tests done by them like failing over the database, and the system followed up with these changes. Uh, if you install the system with these changes, the system followed up uh, with the infrastructure's changes behind them, and the service continued to work seamlessly. So uh, that's part one. And now let's <coughs> go to the managed platform concept. Now at Baseflow, uh, we had a dream. Uh, this dream included butterflies and rainbows, not really. However, we wanted to provide a platform for our clients, which is basically a centralized management by Baseflow via Jenkins for all of our environments, and centralized deployment by Baseflow in our own AWS accounts. Uh, this is a nice dream, I would say, and we still can provide this capability. However, it is not a fit for all of our clients. For example, some of our enterprise clients have their own AWS infrastructure and their own uh, discounts with AWS, which might be higher than what Baseflow can achieve at the moment. And in these cases, they want to run everything in their own infrastructure. 
so there was a conflict. What we presented last year cannot be fulfilled entirely, and why we are still want to do this, um, we are not doing this at the moment as extensively as we would like. So the managed platform concept changed because of those evil butterflies there. Um, and uh, there were some obstacles that we faced with this. There were some regulatory issues. Outsourcing is challenging for most enterprise companies in the financial sector. So they might or might not want to delve into the depths of onboarding us somehow to their company so that we can do all the management. Partially, yes. So for example, they might require us to provide them support. They might require us to do some changes on the system or, or even execute some migration projects. However, giving generic access to our company uh, to do all the stuff that is related to Fineract is sometimes not a way for them to go. Part of it is related to data protection. They work with their clients' data, and uh, having access to client data requires a lot of legal work, actually. Um, I am not a legal expert, but I have been working with such uh, companies who did this outsourcing stuff, and it usually requires at least half a year to create just the paperwork uh, for this to work. Now, another stuff that prevented us from going with the original model was organizational issues. Clients wanted to manage their own infrastructure, as I mentioned. There were dedicated database administrator teams, and only they were capable and allowed to touch the databases. So uh, some parts of the management that we planned to do for them were actually not possible <coughs> with our original model. And there were also technical issues in the implementation uh, for the original concept, like missing features from Finract, like we did not have the liquid base only mode at the time, or we still lack a data archival solution inside Finract, which is actively being worked on, by the way. Uh, there were missing configuration guidelines for production readiness. So all the features that I showed you regarding availability and security and performance in the previous slides uh, were not exactly well documented uh, inside FinRag's documentation. Yes, we provided some guidelines and some Docker Compose files, but at an enterprise, it is pretty unlikely that they will utilize those Docker Compose files directly. They want to run the software on Kubernetes, and our Kubernetes examples were weak, actually, much weaker than our Docker Compose examples. In addition to this, there were and there are still some errors present or bugs present in the Fineract implementation, like this GDBC, GDBC driver parameters bug, uh, which basically means that whenever you initialize a new FinRect instance, it might not get the right GDBC parameters, the configured GDBC parameters, because it gets over, overwritten. Uh, these are some of the stuff that uh, needed to be fixed before any kind of model in production could work. So uh, in today's version, we think about this a little bit differently, which actually includes our original plan but has some additional capabilities in the model. Uh, how we are thinking about this is base flow needs to provide some guardrails for a Finerect implementation. What are these guardrails? Basically, these guardrails make sure that the Finerect instance that is deployed by either us or by our clients or, or, or anybody else um, results in a Finerect instance or a Finerect setup which is similar enough to the other FinRact setups so that they can move together, they can evolve together. It doesn't necessarily mean that they run the same FinRact version with the same capabilities. However, the basic infrastructural stuff and the basic promises of the infrastructure should be similar enough that we can consider all these FinRact deployments similar enough that they can be managed the same way. To support this, we actually split the management part of this to three. One is the owner. An owner for the 
cloud infrastructure component is the one who pays for that component. Uh, another one is the manager who configures that component. And the third one is the client who benefits from the component. Now, there is a distinction from all of these, uh, this distinction between all of these <coughs> uh, stuff and splitting these to these three parts actually enabled us to run the software in another company's AWS infrastructure. It's pretty easy to do. The owner of the infrastructure who pays for it will be the other company. However, the manager can be still us. Now, it can be vice versa. Another party can manage their own infrastructure in our AWS account, making sure that we pay the money and they can do the management stuff. So this model is much more flexible and it can be adapted to diverse needs of our both our enterprise and less enterprise clients, I would say. Uh, to support all of this as well, we implemented for the cloud infrastructure stuff some cost allocation methods. So whenever we create a resource, we create tagging, and based on that tagging, the bill can be split. It comes handy if some clients agree on sharing uh, the same resources in the infrastructure. Uh, there are methods to split the cost of those infrastructure components between or among them. Uh, also, uh, slightly related is that the non-production and production environment types has been split because it is required by the regulations. And the data types that we store in each environment has all also been split to production and non-production values. There is the distinction here. Uh, for example, you can have a UAT environment which actually works based on production data. Uh, it's not recommended, I would say, uh, to work this way. However, this is how most of the companies operate, so uh, we need to support this scenario as well. Uh, to achieve and support all of this, the Terraform and Jenkins code uh, that we originally utilized to create the environments has been open to our partners. Now, uh, obviously, to support all of this, the Terraform code especially and somewhat the Jenkins code needed <coughs> some changes. And <coughs> in this final slide, I will show you an example of what kind of guardrails we provide to our clients uh, whenever they want to use uh, the Terraform code. For example, here is the environment type, which is basically a variable for our Terraform code. And it basically says that the environment type can be development or test or production, and they can set up their environment only using these three values, and nothing else can be used there. Now, why it is required? Because, for example, based on the environment type, we can provide some guarantees for our clients uh, how well among the availability zones the pod will be, pods will be distributed. If they choose to utilize an environment type called UAT, uh, then we cannot act on that. However, this way we can keep, keep the environments consistent. We provide them the guardrails that they require, and basically everything works seamlessly. It's a much more flexible management that we originally planned, and it includes our original dream as well. So uh, that can be achieved within the this framework as well. Same goes to the data type, by the way. Non-production and production data can be stored in the system. And uh, the type of the environment and the type of data are on different axes. So you can have a non-production environment with production data or a production environment with non-production data or whatever else. So conclusion. Uh, we contributed these improvements to Fineract partially. Not everything arrived in the Apache repository yet, like the ham chart is not yet clean enough to be included in the Apache project, basically because of the pretty hard AWS dependencies. However, we are working on uh, <clears throat> pushing those changes, at least most of those changes, uh, to the actual open source repository. And uh, we believe that these improvements, while not contributing to the functional aspects of Vineract, uh, it, they contribute a lot to the non-functional working uh, of Vineract. 
And we have some future plans as well, which are included in this, uh, in this slide. We are working on better tenant management for Fineract. Actually, I see at least two persons sitting in this room who are actively uh, <coughs> working on different aspects uh, of that. And whenever these will be ready, whenever the changes will be ready, we need to make sure that they can run smoothly in production and there is a migration pass and whatever, whatever else is required. And another stuff that I am personally working on with the client is adding archival capabilities to Fineract. There is a discussion on how it should be achieved. For example, if they have loans that are not really interesting anymore, then what should happen? Should they be deleted from the system simply, or should they be moved to another Fineract tenant, or should they be exported to some files so that they can be reloaded to the system later? There is not an end to this discussion yet, and we plan uh, to discuss it with our clients, considering their needs, and after that, discussing it with the larger community as well on what exactly needs to be implemented uh, from these capabilities. Thank you. Uh, this was my presentation on some of the production-related <coughs> aspects of running Fineract. If you have any questions, then please shoot them. <laughs>